morning and welcome to our worship time on this beautiful November day. Uh, we usually don't expect this kind of weather this time of the year, but we're thankful for it. In way of announcements, uh, just several things. Monday, prime timers are meeting at the Long's house at 1230. Uh, Wednesday evening, of course, our Bible study and prayer time here at the church at 630 in the fellowship hall. And then the other important one uh, is the fact that there's a table in the foyer for Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child. If you're planning filling out a shoebox, uh, you need to take a pamphlet that's back there to fill out. Uh, and if you're not able to complete a shoebox, you can cover the cost of one that, for the $9, or if you need help to cover the cost of it, uh, the $9, you can see Roy or Kathy. And the boxes need to be returned to the church by next Sunday, Sunday, November the 15th. So next Sunday is the deadline for the Samaritan's Purse shoe boxes. And then just looking ahead a little bit, uh, the note there in the, in the bulletin, the prime timers will be having their Christmas dinner on Thursday, December the 3rd at 1230 uh, at Pondus. And you need to let Howard know if you plan to attend that. Um, Everything else you can look at for yourself there in the bulletin. Call to worship. Be reading from 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verses 3 and 4. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Christian life as warfare is a very familiar theme that we see throughout the New Testament. And Paul here in 2 Timothy reminds Timothy of that very fact. So as a soldier that is called to duty is severed really from civilian life, so a follower of Christ must refuse to allow the things of this world to distract him. Many have suffered as martyrs for Christ. And in uh, Kenneth Osbrook's book, Amazing Grace, Inspirational Hymn Stories for Daily Devotions, he says this, The church founded by Christ has been built on the blood of martyrs. It has been established, estimated that at least 50 million persons have had a martyr's death since the crucifixion of our Lord. Even today in our 21st century civilized culture, large numbers of believers live under conditions of harassment and persecution. According to historical tradition, many of Christ's disciples and followers were persecuted by enemies of their master with the following fates. Matthew suffered martyrdom by being slain in the city of Ethiopia. Mark died at Alexandria after being dragged through the streets of that city. Luke hanged on an olive tree in the classic land of Greece. John was put in boiling oil, afterward branded at Patmos. Peter crucified at Rome with his head downward. James the Lesser, thrown from a pinnacle of the temple, then beaten to death. Bartholomew flayed alive. Andrew, bound to a cross where he preached to his persecutors until he died. Jude, shot to death with arrows. Matthias, first stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas of the Gentiles, stoned to death at Seleucia. Paul, after various tortures and persecutions, was beheaded at Rome by Emperor Nero. And so as we come together this morning to worship, we need to ask ourselves the questions that we find in our first song that we're going to sing. And that is, am I a soldier of the cross? Am I willing to be persecuted for the sake of the gospel? Am I a follower of the Lord? Shall I fear to own his cause? Must I be carried to skies on flowery beds of ease? Are there no foes for me to face? 
Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by the word. Obviously, in our land that we live, we live in a land of tremendous amount of freedoms. And we've been really, you know, free from persecutions, especially, it seems like, in a rural community. We don't get those persecutions like they do maybe sometimes even in cities or in, in other countries. And there are people that this day are dying for are being martyred for the sake of Christ. And the day may come that that may happen to us. We don't ever know that. Uh, only the Lord knows because he is also, also, obviously the sovereign one. But let's stand together and sing and think about the words, are we really a soldier of the cross? How would we react in the midst of persecution? How will we react if the time comes that we need to be martyred or that we may be martyred? So let's stand together and sing, Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? <clears throat> Am I a soldier of the cross? You may be seated. Good morning, church. <laughs> I am going to read out of uh, a section out of thir uh, Numbers chapter 13 and a section out of Numbers 14. And then also um, Matthew, two verses in Matthew. But the context of Numbers is when, um, when Moses was commanded by the Lord to send 12 spies, one, one man from every tribe of Israel to spy out the land of Canaan that God was going to give them. Um, and I'm going to pick up, and it also is the response after they come back from spying out the land and giving a report. It's the response of the Israelites on their response um, to that report. And I'm going to pick up um, in verse 25 of 13, Numbers 13. And I believe as, we, as I read it, you will hear the cry um, of the Israelites of, from the report of the unbelief toward their Lord um, in this passage, in these passages. Let's go ahead and read. I'll go ahead and read it. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron to all the congregation of the people of Israel, Israel in the wilderness of Paran and at Kadesh. They brought back word to them all to the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are for fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land uh, of the Neg Negad. The Hittites, the Jubasites, 
and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are all able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel and a bad report of the land, and they had, they had spent out saying, bad report of the land, and that they had spied out saying, the land through which the, we live, gone to spy it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people there saw in it are all are of great height. And then we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who came from Nephilim, we seem to over ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel crum- grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that, would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it no longer be for us to go back to Egypt? They said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joseph, and Joshua, excuse me, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we passed through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into his land and give it to us, land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the Lord of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them. The, their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to, the, said to, said to uh, stone them with stones, but the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me, and how long will they not believe in me, in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? I will strike them with the pestilence, and inherit them, and will make them make of a you of a great nation greater and mightier than they. And then in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 through 26. I'll give you a moment to turn there if you want. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for me for my sake will find it for what will it profit a man if he signs gains the whole world and uh, forfeits his soul or what shall a man give in return for his soul that is the reading of god's holy word Let us pray. Father, we recognize ourselves in these passages that we have just read. Like the Israelites, we have heard your promises, but we have been fearful and unbelieving. We have not trusted that your intentions towards us are good. And like Peter, upon hearing about Christ heading to the cross, we've set our minds on the things of men and not upon the things of God. We would rather seek a majestic crown or a comfortable couch than carry a cross. And even though this is true, you have not disinherited us. Rather, we remember what Christ has accomplished Through him, you have forgiven our iniquity, 
and you have promised that you will no longer remember our sins. And so we thank you this morning that we come before you as a forgiven people. And if that were not enough, Lord, you have not only forgiven us, but you have transformed us. We gather together as a transformed people. And we thank you that you have transformed us. And we look back upon Caleb and Joshua, these men who had a different spirit in them. And we recognize that you have given us your Holy Spirit. We look back at Peter, who by that same spirit would, uh, would accept the cost of discipleship. And like him, we have left everything to follow Jesus. And this morning we come to you asking once again that you would sustain and strengthen us as your disciples. As we live, as we live in this world that is passing away and in these bodies that are passing away, we ask that you would help us to fix our eyes on that which is eternal. Father, we pray that you would protect us from worshiping the state. There's been much turmoil over the condition and the recent election and all that's going on in our country. Protect us from believing that the state is our savior and defender. Protect us from believing that it can be our hope and our comfort. And as the world appears increasingly unstable to us, might you make your church into a beacon of stability. Help us to remember that our Lord slept during the storm. Help us to know that you are executing your purposes through your work of providence. Help us to believe that this is a most wise and holy and powerful work and that you, Father, are preserving and governing all of your creatures and all of their actions. None of this is outside your hand or your decree. Father, as we think about things closer to home, we also recognize that some of your people are weary and tired. There are some among us who are discouraged and disheartened there are some who are in pain, some who are afflicted. And we ask that you would once again give that sustaining grace, that they would see that in Christ, you are the one who lifts their heads and holds them up. And when they feel as if they can't go on another day, would you teach them not to rely on themselves, but on you who raises the dead? Father, we would also pray that you would give them health and give them strength, that you might prolong their days on this earth so that they can praise your name and bring you glory on this earth. As we seek to proclaim Christ, Father, we ask that you would give us both opportunity and boldness. Father, so there are those among us who need boldness to proclaim Christ in the workplace. Give that boldness, Father. There are those who need boldness among us to proclaim Christ to our unbelieving family members. Father, it's not long from now that we'll be celebrating hol the holidays with family members that we may not see at other times of the year. Give us opportunity and boldness. We pray for our missionaries as well this morning. We honor them and we often consider them courageous. We know that they have gone out for the sake of your name, and yet, Father, we remember that they too have times of discouragement. They too have times of fear. And as they face trials and obstacles, they may have those moments of wondering, will you be faithful again? Will you come through again? We would pray that you would show yourself faithful to them, that you would remove their obstacles, that you would help them through every trial that your word might go forth. Finally, this morning, we pray for our brother Roy. Father, we thank you for how he has faithfully served your church over the years. As he serves us now this morning through proclaiming the word, Father, I can't help but think of 
a couple of servants from the book of Acts. I think of Philip and Stephen, men who had been set aside, who had been set apart to serve tables, and yet, Father, you also worked through their words. Your spirit empowered them so that their words would be mighty and transformative, Father. We would pray that you would use our brother Roy by the power of your spirit in a similar way this morning. Do a mighty work among us, Father. We need you. We confess that we need you. Oh, how we also confess that you are able and willing and faithful to meet that need. And so we praise you, Father, and we love you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Reading a couple more verses in 2 Timothy after Paul has given this exhortation to Timothy that he must endure hardship as a good soldier. He goes on with the encouragement in verse 8 that he says, remember. I think that's a really important ver word in this particular passage of scripture and in the lives. He says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. That's verse 8. For which I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And as we stand together again to sing, we need to remember that indeed Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead. And in that remembering, we remember that he is the one, that Christ is the one who will hold us fast. In the midst of whatever it is that we may go through, the trials of our lifetime, the, the, uh, the persecutions, martyrdom, or when we, fail, when we fear even as that our faith will fail, Christ is the one that will hold us fast. When we think that the tempter is going to be the one that will prevail, Christ is the one who will hold us fast. <clears throat> and so he goes on, he says, he'll not let my soul be lost. His promises, his promises shall last. Isn't it wonderful to realize and to understand the fact that Nothing depends on us. We can't do any of this. It's God working through us, and it's God working to, uh, to in, it cause us to uh, be more and more dependent upon him and that he is the one <clears throat> who will hold us fast. Let's stand together and sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. <clears throat>
You may be seated. What a blessing to the truth of that message is. Oh, good morning, brothers and sisters. It's a joy to stand before you once again in this capacity. May God bless us and be with us as we worship him together. In the early to mid-1800s, there was a young man in Scotland named John Patton. John was a pastor. I don't know all the details of his life, of course, but uh, he had a very vital ministry there in Scotland. He was in whatever his church was or wherever it was, I don't know exactly. He had a great ministry among young people and certain other specific ministries in the city. And at some point, though, it, Many people had been touched and used, or God had used John Patton to touch the lives of many people. At some point, however, he felt called to leave the comforts of his homeland and go to preach the gospel where it had never been heard before. He felt called to go to the New Hebrides, a chain of islands in the South Pacific. About 10 years prior to that, the first European missionaries had gone to, this, to these islands, two young British men who sadly did not make it very long. Within a period of weeks or months, they were killed and eaten by the natives who were, who were cannibals. When John heard that story, amazingly, he was inspired. He said, these islands have now been baptized by the blood of the martyrs. God is sanctifying them to hear his gospel, to bring them to him. Probably not surprisingly, John met some resistance from his colleagues about this call. They said, why would you leave a known ministry where you're being used mightily by God for something totally unknown? And at one point in a, a meeting, um, an elderly a man named Mr. Dixon just threw up his hands and said what was on everybody's mind. He said, John, you'll be eaten by the cannibals. To which John gave this classic reply. He said, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years and your prospect within a relatively short time will be to be laid in the grave and to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that as long as I can serve Christ with all my heart and soul and spirit, it doesn't matter to me if I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. He said, and I tell you one thing, Mr. Dixon, in the last day, my resurrected body will shine just as fairly as yours. Wonderful reply to a a colleague who had well-meaning concern, but probably misplaced concern. The thesis of this message, or the, the main thrust of it, is that joyful abandon to Christ is the only life worth living. Only the life that is lived for the Christ who bought us without regard to self only this life, brothers and sisters, is fulfilling and meaningful. It is the purpose for which we are created, to give ourselves to Christ's person, his kingdom, and his ways. Now, before we go any farther, I need to give credit. The inspiration and part of the structure for this message comes from this little book by John Piper called Risk is Right. It's an easy read. You can read it in about an hour. And uh, I recommend it. it. It had a big impact on me. What is the most important thing to you in life? What is worth the most to you? Now, if we were asked that in an informal 
off-the-cuff tone, we all might give different answers to that. And I want to just take this opportunity and speak directly to the young people and the children among us, or anyone within the sound of my voice right now, and ask you, in the quietness of your own heart, what is important to you? What is most important to you? Well, do I remember what was most important to me when I was your age? And uh, frankly, it was, <clears throat> excuse me, it was a bunch of frivolous nonsense for the most part. Now, that doesn't mean that's the case with you. That's just, that's, that's who I was at your age. But it's not too early. If you, as a young person and a child, are able to understand my voice, it's not too early for you to ask that question. What is most important to me? What is worth the most to me in life? And even more important than that, what should be? What should be worth the most to us? Because whether we're a young person or whether we're an, we're an adult, we need the grace of God to show us what is truly important. So I ask all of us this morning, what should be most important to us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? Scripture, excuse me, Scripture talks about that question through and through. It's one of the main themes of Scripture. What do we, as men and women, boys and girls created in the image of God, what do we focus on? What should be the main purpose of our lives? By the way, we'll be turning to, or we won't be turning to, I will reference a number of scriptures this morning. Don't feel obligated to turn to them all. But possibly the most important scripture which answers that question is found in Philippians chapter 1. And I would ask you to turn there this morning. This is a prime example of scripture's answer to that question, what should be uppermost in our lives. Philippians chapter 1, I'm going to read only two verses, beginning at verse 20. The Apostle Paul writes, According to my earnest expectation and hope, that I shall not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ shall even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That was a long introduction. Let us pray for the rest of the message. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would use these feeble words this morning. Open our hearts, Lord. Call us to yourself. May we see beyond ourselves to you and the glory of your kingdom. Fill us with your spirit. Come and teach us your ways, dear Father. Show us your glory and beauty that we might rise up and leave all else and follow you alone, trusting in you alone. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, because you alone, Lord, are worthy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we just read that beautiful passage of scripture, and Paul wrote, to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. We could distill the meaning out of that scripture in several different ways. We could paraphrase it in different ways. But it answers the question we posed, and, and th th these are my words of how to rephrase its message. Our main thrust in life should be to honor and worship God, to love him with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, to believe in Christ, to have our sins forgiven and cleansed, and to serve him with all of our hearts. For Paul, the ultimate value, the ultimate worth, was that Jesus Christ would be honored in his life whether he lived or whether he died. And he didn't, like John Patton, he didn't care as long as Christ was honored in his life. And brothers and sisters, that should be, and may it be, our ultimate worth, our ultimate value 
the ultimate goal for our lives. As Christians, we give our lives to our Lord, considering all that he's done for us. We give our lives unto him to do with us just as he pleases. Actually, that's the whole purpose for which the universe was created. Colossians 1 and verse 16 says this, For in him, that is, in our Lord Jesus Christ, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So, that establishes what Christians really already know, the main purpose, the main focus on our life, of our lives. How then do we flesh that out in our individual lives, in our daily lives? Each of us is different. We are individuals, we have different gifts, different callings, different abilities. The ways in which we honor Christ are as different, as unique, as we are, but common to us all, as we have said, is that need to love God, to obey him, to give our lives to him in whatever he would call us to do. Now we people tend to compare ourselves to one another. Probably something we shouldn't do very often, but I have often found myself falling into that trap. And we ask questions a lot of times, so we could ask, are some ways of serving Christ more important than others? A classic example is you take on one hand a person like John Patton, a pastor, a missionary, greatly used by God. On the other hand, you have a common person like us, a common laborer, factory worker, custodial worker, housewife, what, whatever you have, and we say, well, we, we tend to think, surely, the labor of the one who's given great efforts for the kingdom, who has obvious results for the kingdom of God, is far more important than my service. I'm just a common person. But I tell you today, dear ones, the difference, that difference is only in the eyes of men, not of God. God knows us perfectly. He created each of us for his purposes, and we each have our part to play. We won't spend time there, but we think of, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 12, where, or, or one of those chapters where Paul uses the analogy of the body. He says, Christ is the head, and each one of us are members of his body. One's an eye, one's an ear, so on and so forth. Parts of the body are more attractive to us than others, but each has a vital, important function. And without any of the bodily members, the whole body hurts, the whole body suffers. So we each have our part to play in the kingdom of God and in this world, as the kingdom is manifested in this world. One is just as important as the other. The truly important thing for each of us is to believe in Christ, to obey him, to keep his commandments. To truly give our hearts and lives to Christ in this way will free us from the fear of death, will free us from the fear of risk. To truly give ourselves to Christ in this way will make us imitators of him. Hebrews chapter 12 says something very important about our Lord Jesus Christ. It talks about his motives for going to the cross. Chapter 2 of verse 12 says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Why did, as our great example, why did Jesus willingly give himself to die? Most obviously because he was obeying the Father whom he loved. But Hebrews chapter 12 tells us he did it for joy. He did it for the joy that was set before him. What joy? Joy of being raised from the dead. The joy of returning to the fellowship of the Father and the glory that they had together. The joy of saving many souls from eternal death. The joy of having completed a great work that was infinite in scope. The joy of being surrounded by worshipers forever. The joy made the pain and the suffering, which we cannot comprehend, it was spiritual suffering as well as physical, made it all worthwhile. And just like Jesus, now, we are to follow in his train, so did the early Christians. They gave their lives, many of them, for the sake of Christ and for his kingdom, for others. Hebrews chapter 10, the author of the book is writing to the Hebrew Christians and he says, for you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. The early Christians knew that on the other side of death for them lay eternal joy. If they were faithful unto death, if they followed and loved Christ with all their hearts, if they gave themselves at his command for the good of others. And in this fallen world, that always involves risk. What is risk? We all know what it is, but it's pretty easy to define, too. Risk is a situation that we voluntarily enter into that brings the possibility of loss. Possibility of loss of finances, of relationships, friends, family, so on. Loss of reputation loss of health, or in the ultimate situation, possible loss of life. We tend to shy away from risks, don't we, just by nature. Is it wise to take risks? Of course, the simple answer to, it, to that is it depends on what we're risking for, depends on what we're risking. A couple of silly examples if you take your whole paycheck next week and blow it on a lottery ticket or on however that works, is that a wise risk? If you are driving your car and you decide because you're in a hurry to pass on a blind curve, you're taking a risk all right, but is it wise? You are risking your life and the lives of others for the nebulous goal of getting to your destination a few moments quicker. Such risks are foolish and they're not wise. In such a case like that, to lose your life in such a risk or to lose your paycheck or whatever is just to waste it. But how about a risk that if it's successful, it will greatly benefit other people? We turn back to John Patton just for a moment and many of you may be familiar with his life, but John did go to the New Hebrides Within the first six months, I think it was, he suffered amazing loss. His, he wasn't eaten by cannibals, thank the Lord, but his young wife and their infant son all died of disease within the first several months. John buried them. He was heartbroken. But by the grace of God, he found the strength to go on. By the end of his life, 
and he had gone back and forth different times, but uh, there were thousands of believers in the New Hebrides. There was a thriving church established there. His risk was ultimately worthwhile. It greatly honored God. For those of us who are afraid of risk, and that's often, it's, it's sometimes true of each of us, we need to ask ourselves, can we fully avoid it? Of course, the answer is no. To use a quote from John Piper, risk is woven into the very fabric of our daily lives. We're not God. We are finite. We can't see the future. We, we do see parts of the future that our Lord has graciously revealed to us, but the details we don't know. We don't know what tomorrow holds for us. James tells us in chapter four of his book, he said, come now, you who say, tomorrow we will go into such and such a city and abide there for a few years and buy and sell and make profit. James says, no, you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. It's just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes. He says, you should say rather, it, if, if it is the Lord's will, we will go here and do this or do that. Everything we do involves risk. It, it permeates our very lives. We cling to sometimes an illusion of safety. The truth is we don't know if our hearts will keep beating until the end of this message. We don't know if we go to a restaurant next week that there might be some dangerous bacteria in the food that we would eat there. You don't know the next, neither do I, the next time we go to a mall if some gunman might take us out. Now I don't mean to frighten anyone because statistically speaking, thank the Lord, the chance of those things happening are very small but we don't know for sure. And we would do well to remember that. Safety, complete safety on this earth, in this life is indeed a mirage. Some places are safer than others. Catawissa is probably safer than Philadelphia. Philadelphia is probably a lot safer than North Korea or Iran. But we can't find anywhere that's totally risk-free in this life. In the scripture reading, our brother Dan read part of the story of the Israelite spies. The place where they were sent out from and came back to, the place where all the dialogue happened was called, is called in scripture Kadesh Barnea. And we remember the story. The 10 spies were terrified of what they had seen. He said, we can't we can't go up and conquer those people. They're so much bigger than us. They're so much stronger than us. Caleb and Joshua said, on the other hand, yes, they're bigger, but we can do it. God, has pro God is commanding us to. He's going to be with us. If God is with us, I'm paraphrasing, of course, who can be against us? But the voices of the many prevailed over the voices of the two, and they wanted to stone Caleb and Joshua. God said to them, okay, have it your way. You're gonna wander back and forth in the wilderness for 40 more years until you die here. Your children are gonna go in for sure, but you're not. What a waste. What a tragic waste of life and opportunity. Unless we be too hard on them dear ones today, we all have our Kadesh Barneas sometimes in our lives. May God help us to make the right decisions at those times. May he grant us his spirit to do so. It is right and good to risk for the cause of Christ. Jesus himself said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. Just before he was resurrected, or I'm sorry, before he ascended into heaven, he told his disciples, 
Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. As believers, as, as believers in Christ, as children of God, when we have those precious promises that he will be with us, that he will build his church, how can we not risk for his sake? What is the gospel? Just a quick review. The gospel is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. If we repent from our sin, if we turn from it, if we believe in him with all of our hearts, if we confess his name before others, we will be forgiven. We will be saved and cleansed from our sin. We will be brought back into fellowship with God. And as we believe, we, ex we begin to experience those things. The gospel grants us true hope for eternity. And hope, brothers and sisters, grants us the strength we need to live to, to love others in the face of danger, such as taking the gospel to foreign tribes. God-given hope grants us the ability to take risks for the sake of others. Two quick examples from the Old Testament. I won't go into, won't go into detail about them because the stories are well known to us, but Queen Esther. Esther is a Jewess in her, people are in captivity in the Persian kingdom. Esther is through a series of providences taken to be the queen of the land, but her husband, the king, does not know that she is a Jew. A wicked man is raised up to, who hates the Jews, who tricks the king into signing an edict to wipe them out. Esther's uncle, who's also in government service, sends word to her, Esther, you must go into the king to plead for your people. Esther sends word back to him, I can't go into the king without being called. Anyone who's summoned into the inner courts who's not called for, the sentence is the instant death, unless the king holds out his golden scepter to us, to that person as a sign of mercy. And I haven't been called for weeks and weeks and weeks. Her uncle Mordecai says these words to her in chapter, chapter 4 of the book of Esther. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows that you have not attained royalty for such a time as this? Esther made her decision. Then Esther told them to reply, Go, assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens also will fast in the same way. And thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Now that is acceptance of risk for a noble and worthy cause. Esther didn't know what the outcome would be. And when we risk, neither do we. That's what makes it a risk. Esther made her decision on the basis of love for her people and of faith in her sovereign God. She knew that he would do what is right and good. She had to take this risk or just bury her head in the sand and forget the whole thing. So she said, if I perish, I perish. And we know, by the grace of God, the king received her and her people were saved. A similar example from the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter three, three young Israelites are in, captive, or in captivity in Babylon. They have risen by the grace of God to high positions in the king's court. 
Proud King Nebuchadnezzar sets up a statue to himself and commands everyone to fall down and worship it. The young Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse. It's told to the king. He calls him. He gives him another chance. He said, if you don't do it, I'm going to throw you alive into a furnace. And just like John Patton's reply to Mr. Dixon, the reply of the young Hebrews is classic. It's in Daniel chapter 3. You don't need to turn there unless you want to. But um, basically, they say, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't even need to think about how to reply to you. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, be it known to you, O king, we will not serve. We will not bow down to your golden image. We will worship the true God. Of course, the king is enraged. He's used to having his own way. Throws him into the furnace. But God miraculously delivers them. God, God himself appears to them and is with them in the furnace. It's an amazing testimony of power and deliverance to the Babylonians. It would have been very easy for them to say, oh, we'll just save our lives and worship God quietly in our own homes. But they took the risk for the glory of God. They were willing to risk their lives and entrust themselves to God completely, trusting that he is able to restore in the end and that he will do all things well. Our New Testament example of risk is the Apostle Paul himself. Paul lived his whole life with risk. In Acts chapter 21, and you can turn to Acts chapter 21. The story here is that Paul is finished with his third missionary journey. He is being sent to Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem hasn't been there for years, and he, his plan is to bring some relief funds to the church there, but he also has business to conduct with uh, the leaders of the Jewish church in Jerusalem. Paul and his party in Acts chapter 21 lay over in the seacoast town of Caesarea. While they're there, a prophet named Agabus comes to Paul, takes Paul's belt, ties his own hands up with it and says, just in this manner, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt. Of course, Paul's friends are terrified and they strongly urge him not to go. And in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 21, Paul says, then Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, the will of the Lord be done. At that point, Paul knew that affliction awaited him. He didn't know the details. He didn't know exactly when, exactly how, he knew he would be bound, but he didn't know what else would happen. But he judged the risk to be worth it, to carry out the mission that God had given him. Paul knew very well that life on this earth is filled with risk. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he gives a brief overview of his ministry so far. And I'm going to read a few verses in 2 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 24. Paul writes, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, 
from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, on the sea, dangers among false brethren. In essence, what Paul is saying there is that nowhere is safe. The waterways weren't safe for Paul. The roads weren't safe for him. The Jews and the Gentiles, neither group were safe. There were people in both groups who wanted to kill him. Just a reminder, Paul is reminding us that the safety, the earthly safety and security that we often cling to is a mirage for all of us. So day by day, we have two choices, to live our lives with risk or to waste them. Turning back one page to Acts chapter 20, Paul writes these words in verse uh, verse 24. Paul writes, But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. That was the same Apostle Paul who wrote in Philippians, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And our Lord Jesus himself said, a disciple is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Now, it may be that someone is hearing the sound of my voice today and you don't really understand. You say, well, why would I risk anything for the Lord Jesus Christ? Why would, I, why would I do that? Well, the alternative to risking our lives for our Lord Jesus is to waste our lives on ourselves. Many of us are familiar with the old saying that uh, a man who is wrapped up in himself makes a very small package. Let's turn to John chapter 12, the 12th chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus is speaking here, beginning at verse 24. He's saying, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. If it risks itself for my sake, it bears much fruit. I could paraphrase. Verse 25, he who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. speaking still to someone who may not really understand yet and grasp some of these deep issues of the gospel. Scripture tells us that in God, each of us lives and moves and has our being. Whether we know it or not, he's given us life. And each of us knows by the, before we come to know Christ especially, by the rebellion, by the restlessness that we feel in our hearts, that by the self-will that we have, by the guilt that we have deep down, we know that we have rebelled against God grievously. Psalm 14 says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Romans chapter six, verse 23 puts it like this, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
the good news of the gospel is this, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That this is eternal life, that they may know you. But this is part of the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the Father, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Only God is worthy of our lives. So if anyone has not yet committed themselves or thinks that the Lord doesn't understand what this is all about, Lord Jesus Christ offers us eternal forgiveness, healing, and salvation, and only he is worthy of our lives. In closing, brothers and sisters, I urge you, whoever you are, whatever your station in life, give your heart unto the Lord Jesus and serve him without fear. Love other people in his name. That involves risk. It possibly involves heartbreak, but it's worthwhile. The only alternative, as has been said several times, is to waste our lives on ourself. A brief word of personal testimony. Those of you who've known me a long time know that when I was younger, I had a chance to travel quite a bit. And um, I've been in different parts of the world and eh, seen some things. But I would sometimes come back from those journeys kind of empty in heart. And I didn't really understand why. Years later, I began to understand why. Because while I was taking those trips, they were all about me. They were all about seeing things, experiencing new things, meeting people, learning different cultures. That's not wrong in itself. But it can't be the main focus of life. To live our lives for those things is to be wrapped up in ourselves and to waste our lives. God graciously helped me to see through that trap. A few final words about risk. Risk doesn't need to be big. You don't need to be Queen Esther to take a risk. You don't need to be three young, <clears throat> excuse me, the three young Hebrews and have to go up before the mightiest king in the world at that time. You don't need to be a John Patton and be called to another part of the world. Such things are wonderful, but God doesn't call everyone to do those things. Risk can be as small, as small in the world's eyes. It can be as small as loving someone of reaching out to someone who might not love you back, who might not reach back. That's risky and it's possibly painful. Sometimes we are called by God to larger risks in life, sometimes to smaller. One important prayer that we can pray every day is simply, Lord, what would you have me to do today? Show me, Lord, and Whatever it is, give me the strength to do it. it. Might be something I really don't want to do. That really goes against the grain, but Lord, you will give strength if it is your will. We need to remember Jesus' words that whoever gives a cup of cold water in my name to one of these little ones, he will never lose his reward. What encouraging and blessed words those are, that God sees the smallest thing that we do out of love, out of a sincere heart. We each have our Kadesh Barneas, don't we? We each have our places of decision. Sometimes we fail. I have failed many times. May God grant us grace to make the right decisions in him, to step out in risk. I'm going to read two passages of scripture in closing. Both of them brief. The 
first one is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, words of the Apostle Paul. Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he says, he's, he's talking about coming to them for the third time and he's not sure of some different details of, he's not exactly sure of his welcome there, but he said, it says in verse 15, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. May we go and do likewise. And the final one will be just a repeat of the words which Dan read from Matthew 16 at the beginning. Those powerful words of Jesus, which all of us would do well to remember each day. Beginning, excuse me, beginning in verse 24 of chapter 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. For what shall a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Brothers and sisters, thank you for your patience. Life is short. Eternity is long. Eternity is forever. Self speaks very loud. Self calls us to waste our lives, to frittle, what's the word, fritter our lives away in meaningless nonsense. <laughs> Risk for the kingdom. Ask God what he would have you to do today. And I know that we, we do that, brothers and sisters, but this is just a, a reminder of how easily we are sidetracked. May God bless us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus on our behalf. Thank you that he loved not his life unto the death, but he provided life, eternal life for us. How can we do less, Lord? Help us to give our lives to you. Take us, use us, make us beautiful. Teach us your ways. Help us to know what you would have us to do and grant us grace to turn away from ourselves and our fears and follow you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Roy. And as we think about that risk, here's the consolation or here's the confidence that we have. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And the consolation that we have in, the, in, the, in, 
and that we can grasp hold of those words and in the midst of the risk and those things that face us is because Jesus lives and so shall I. Jesus lives and reigns supreme and his kingdom still remains. Jesus lives and by his grace, victory over my passions, giving, uh, I will cleanse, uh, giving life and death nor, death, nor powers of hell. Jesus lives and death is now, but my entrance into glory, courage then my soul from thou, hast the crown of life before thee. Thou shalt find thy hopes were just, Jesus is the Christian's trust. Let's stand together and sing, and I think we have the right words on the screen, even though it's not what's printed in the bulletin. Uh, Jesus lives and so shall I. words of comfort. Jesus is the Christian's trust. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You are dismissed.